absorption uh, of a photon today. So let's let me just review some of this because it may be new to some of you, and um, in any case, it's fundamental material. These are the homogeneous Maxwell equations in uh, MKS or SI units. The inhomogeneous ones are Gauss's law and this law which started with um, pair and then was improved by Maxwell who had that last term. Uh, you see why that last term wasn't obvious uh, uh, in the beginning, namely that it only involves E dot and it has a 1 over C squared. Um, we have E as minus grad P. Whoops. Minus A dot. And of course, as always, B is a curl A. That seems to be an equation that works with any system of units. The four vector A mu is P over C and the vector A. Okay, there's. Well, it's hard to skip this stuff because it's so important. A gauge transformation of the ordinary kind is uh, of that form and under it E and B uh, do not change. And then another point, of course, is that one can use this gauge transformation to pick a convenient gauge for quantization. In fact, one has to do that. Um, the gauge is nice for um, a non-relativistic treatment. Well, it's, it's not incorrect, but it's just that we're treating the, the atoms non-relativistically. Um, is the Coulomb gauge, which A has no divergence, and in which the first or the zero or the fourth component of the um, of the uh, gauge field is turned into is is by Gauss's law turned into an integral. And this term is the term that becomes minus e squared over r in the um, in the Hamiltonian for the atom. Hydrogen atom, let's say. In the absence of uh, rho and j, then of course you have uh, <coughs> you have the vector potential satisfies the wave equation, which makes possible, uh, it says that electromagnetic waves move at the speed of light through the um, We We use box quantization where k is 2 pi of vector n of integers. And um, because of this wave equation, you see we want to have omega equal to kc, where k is the length of uh, the vector k. And we choose polarization vectors that, because of the Coulomb gauge condition, are perpendicular to the uh, momentum. So k dot epsilon r of k is equal to zero. And the other two are all from normal to that, so they're transverse decay. And the electromagnetic field, now this is, I'm going to put in the time dependence engendered by the free Hamiltonian, so this is sum over k, sum over the two polarizations, h bar over 2 epsilon 0 v omega k to the one half 
epsilon R A A sub R. Oh, I wonder. Um, you know, I think what I'm going to do just to make things a little bit different this time, I'm just going to put in the field at time zero. And then in that case, this is just A sub R. E to the I, A dot X, plus uh, epsilon C R A star, A R dagger, T e to the I, it's not going to be the X. This is, in fact, the field that we're going to be using in the, um, in the, uh, uh, in the perturbation theory. Now, um, if, the time dependence that would come in here, this is the the, the, the uh, annihilation operator at zero and uh, the creation operator in zero and the commutation relations here are Commutation relations between annihilation and creation operators, and the time dependence engendered by the free Hamilton, the Hamiltonian for the um, uh, the, field, the electromagnetic field in the absence of charges that it is um, an e to the plus or minus i omega t. In fact, this is the last homework problem of the. I guess fifth set is to take this expression for the field for the Hamiltonian and show that this is in fact equal to um, a sum on K, a sum on R, H bar omega K. A dagger K, well, A dagger, the notation we're using, R K, A R of K plus a half. All right, so this is the Hamiltonian for the, um, ele the electromagnetic field of <coughs> charges. The matter Hamiltonian. Uh, I'm going to draw a spin uh, is 1 over twice the reduced mass, which I'm just going to write as M. Uh, P minus QA of X, and I'm taking this at time 0 plus QC of X and 0. And this um, phi is the phi from this equation, the phi that was determined by Gauss's law. And so um, here the rho is the rho charge density of the proton. That gives you then the phi, and that gives you the normal expression over here. So in other words, this is going to be H0 matter um, minus Q squared over 4 pi epsilon 0 length of the vector x or P squared over 2m minus alpha h bar c over x. Um, that's because uh, the alpha is 1 over 137 dimensionless. It's also E squared over h bar c where E is in the other set of units. Um, unrationalized baseline sign the limits to be exact. Oh, wait a second. I somehow, I somehow really screwed this up. Hold on. Um, this is two zero m is p squared over two m minus that, and h matter is h zero m, um, and then minus.
minus q over m a of x is 0 dot p. And then another term, which can be ignored in lowest order. Okay, so, and so in other words, this thing v, we're going to take v as minus q over m a dot p plus q squared over 2m a squared. But this term is smaller than this, so we'll concentrate on the first term. Notice that in the Coulomb case, a dot p equals p dot a. That's another of the nice things about the Coulomb case. Now, we're talking about a certain kind of transition. This is where the atom is in an ice state, and a photon comes zinging in, let's say, momentum k. And the final state here is an atom in a final state, the f state, and no photon. Or, to be more general, we have n of these, and now we have n minus 1, n minus 1 photons. So the transition is between the states i, n sub r of k, to final state of the atom, n sub r of k minus 1. So that's the transition. And the interaction with Hamiltonian, you remember we write it in this way by essentially factoring out the free field dependence, the simple time dependence. Okay, one can think of this as in the Schrodinger picture, and this as in the interaction picture. It seems to me there's a little too much photography going on. Okay, now, this is hard to calculate, but we don't need to calculate it, because we're interested in its matrix elements only between states, the initial state and the final state, which are eigenstates of H0m and of H0f. So the key point here is that f, n sub r minus 1, v sub i of t, that should be initial, initial n photons of polarization r momentum k. This thing is then equal because these things are eigen, these states are eigenstates of these operators, is just e to the i ef plus h bar omega times n minus 1, n sub r minus 1, t over h bar, the matrix element f, n sub r minus 1, v of 0, i, n sub r, and then a phase factor here, e to the minus i, e i plus n h bar omega, t over h bar. So this is the answer to that thing that was puzzling me. Somehow, in my notes, I was saying that the field, I was thinking of this field, the free field time dependence, I said it was in the interaction picture, so all we just needed to move the rest of the operators to that picture. But in fact, the right way to think about it is, we're looking at everything in time 0, we translate them in time with the free Hamiltonian that we factor out, and then that, because we're always in this S matrix picture, we're only talking about transitions between eigenstates of the free Hamiltonian, we don't need to compute what this thing actually is, everything just pops out like that. So in other words, f, n r minus 1, v, i of t, i, 
in R land is E to the I, EF minus EI minus H bar omega K say, T over H bar times F and R minus 1 V I and R. So it has the simple time dependence. And in fact, when you're actually on resonance, there's no time dependence at all because the energy of the photon is exactly the difference in the energy level. Okay. Well, what is this structure here? Well, F and R minus 1, A sub R of K, I, N sub R is just equal to, well, of course I shouldn't have quite done that part. This is a direct product state. And so what I should just have done was we just review this. N sub R minus 1, N sub R is just equal to the square root of N sub R. For the, for this mode over here, that is to say, we don't have any photons that have any other, any other polarization or momentum in that state. So since this is the case, then the full matrix element, N sub R minus 1, V, I, N sub R, which is this thing here or this expression there, we then go back to this and we see that what we have is we have to take this factor, the polarization vector, the phase factor, and then A sub R, which gives us the square root of N, and then we have to dot that into minus Q over M and the momentum operator. And so what this gives us then is H bar over 2 epsilon 0 V omega K to the 1 half square root of N sub R, the factor minus Q over M, and then what's left is an atomic matrix element of the phase factor E to the I K dot X epsilon R of K dot P I. So that's, that's the, that's the expression. And that key expression is the one that gives you the selection rules and so on and so forth. And we're going to massage this somewhat. It itself is somewhat complicated because X here is actually the operator that was commutated with P, this I H bar. The epsilon is an innocent bystander. But what we'll find out is that K dot X for optical frequencies is, and for atoms that are, say, like the hydrogen atom, somewhere near its ground state is something like 1 over 1,000. And so when we expand this exponential, the first term is 1, the next term is minus I divided by 1,000. So we drop that term and all the other terms. So this just turns into the number 1. That's called the dipole approximation. Okay. So the thing that occurs in our integral is this expression here, which is this phase factor times this combination. And so in other words, the S matrix element, say, up to time T by N, or the S operator if you want, is minus Q over N square root of NR. This 
bloody fact is that I should have labeled this by something simple, called it alpha or something, beta. And then we have integral zero to t, e to the i, e f minus e i minus h bar omega, t prime over h bar d t prime. And then we have here minus i over h bar f e to the i k dot x, epsilon sub r dot t i. So this is our expression. What we're doing here is we toss out s is 1. In other words, s, you know, is where? Let me just go over here. s, of course, is a time-ordered product, e to the minus i integral. In this case, 0 to t of e sub i of t prime, t prime is an h bar here. And so this is 1 minus i over h bar integral 0 to t, e sub i of t prime, t prime plus higher order terms, and we just keep the first one. So this integral, of course, is a trivial integral to do. It's just an integral of a phase factor. And what we find is if, let me just focus on this integral so I don't have to write everything several times. This integral turns into e to the i, e f minus e i minus h bar omega, omega k sub t over h bar minus 1. And it's divided by i e f minus e i minus h bar omega divided by h bar. And so that's what the integral is. And so altogether, this S operator between the initial and final states is q over n h bar n sub r over 2 epsilon 0 volume of quantization omega k to the 1 half f e to the i k dot x epsilon dot t i. And then e to the i k dot x minus e i minus h bar omega k t over h bar minus 1 divided by e f minus e i minus h bar omega. So what's next? Well, the probability of the transition is this thing here squared. And so that's q squared over m squared h bar n sub r over 2 epsilon 0 v omega k. This matrix element k dot x epsilon dot t. Remember, this is epsilon sub r of k. That's the value squared. Now, this thing here, what you do is the overall phase doesn't matter. You multiply by e to the minus i, this delta e term, t over 2 h bar. And that turns this thing into a sine, but it's not twice the sine. It's 2 i times the sine. And so when you take the absolute value squared, you get a 4 sine squared of e f minus e i minus h bar omega t over 2 h bar. And then in the denominator, we have the difference in energy. OK, so that's the probability. Now, 
We've used a couple of times already a certain identity, namely the limit T goes to infinity of sine squared. Let me make this a little, let me shorten the notation a little bit. Sine squared delta E T over 2H bar divided by delta E squared is equal to pi T over 2H bar delta of delta E. So that's our delta function identity. And that means that this complicated expression here just gets replaced by a delta function, which will be simple and useful. And we'll then say that our transition rate, apart from the density of final states, will be just dP dT. And that will give us the following then. This transition rate is let me well, maybe I'll write it in two steps. T squared over M squared N sub R over epsilon zero B and maybe K the matrix element squared delta of E M minus E I minus H bar omega well, that's just about all there is to it. Then remember that let me write it here. Q squared is equal to alpha H bar C four pi epsilon zero. This is sort of a way to translate from SI units into things that are either completely standard or dimensionless. And that means that what we get here is four pi squared from alpha H bar C N sub R over M squared B and maybe K. And then the matrix element squared and then delta of E F minus E I minus H bar omega. Alright, now we're going to start fiddling. We need to do something about this matrix element. We need to compute it. And what we're going to do is we're going to replace P by the commutator of X position of the electron with the three matter Hamiltonian. So what we're going to do then is say X sub I H zero matter is X sub I P squared over 2M and that is a sum on I J X I P J squared over 12. P J let me factor this. P J P J plus P J X I P J over 2M and that then just gives us I H bar over M P sub I. So in other words X or to put it differently P P is equal to M over I H bar times X commutated with H zero M. Now the reason that's useful is that these states are eigenstates of H zero M. However, it's not useful unless we make the dipole approximation because in the absence of the dipole approximation we have more X's here which 
which then uh, aren't going to commute from the age zero m. So, so we're going to make the dipole approximation now. Um, and in, in order to do that a little bit more rigorously, let's just look at calculate the mean value of R in the state NLM of the hydrogen atom. And the answer is A0 over 2 times 3N squared minus L plus 1. So that uh, mean value goes up with N squared, and uh, it goes down with, with L because of the high orbital angular momentum thing sometimes goes in uh, close to the atom. By the way, uh, a French group, this was 20 or 30 years ago, um, I forget the names of the people, but they decided to do atomic physics really carefully and to try to probe this. And so they would use lasers to coax the hydrogen atom up to very high end states so that A0 n squared was not um, down on the angstrom range, but was up at, and I don't remember, unfortunately, how high they got, whether they got up to a micron or a millimeter. I don't think they got up to a meter because that would have been awkward for the experiment. It would have been banging into the sides of the vacuum vessel. But um, what they did, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if going to reach it something was not In any event, what we can see <coughs> is that, therefore, um, the mean value of k dot x, say, the absolute, we just take the absolute value of k dot x. This is then k is 2 pi over lambda, and then I'll just take the first term here, 3 halves a0 n squared. And so uh, this is then. Uh, uh, 3 pi is essentially 10, a0 over lambda n squared, and um, a0 is half a, an angstrom. This is something like 5,000 angstroms. So this is uh, so this is a half. Well, if we multiply a half times 10, we get 5 over 5,000. So that's n squared over 1,000. And um, that, that means then that if you're not dealing with Rydberg atoms, which is what the French group called the most big hydrogen atoms, uh, if you're not dealing with Rydberg atoms, then this thing is very, very small. And if you're talking about ordinary hydrogen with not stimulated by lasers, then it's, it's at normal room temperature, then you're talking about essentially the ground state and maybe occasionally in excited state. So it's, it's um, one part in a thousand. So we expand uh, e to the i k dot x as one minus i k dot x um, plus a half uh, i, what did I say minus? Plus i k dot x. Plus i k dot x squared. And, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, we can just pop all these terms because they're exceedingly small. Well, once we've done that, then we can really make use of this identity that P is the commutator of X with um, X with uh, M H bar. Um, so this W hat, we're going to now write this way. W hat then is 4 pi squared alpha C over NR H bar V omega K F epsilon dot X remember P gets replaced by the commutator of um, X with H bar H H zero matter times M over I H bar it was those H bars that squared that um, had an impact in there. Commutator H0M 
Okay, but this, these initial final states, of course, are eigenstates of H0n, and so this thing is, uh, this matrix element F epsilon dot, this is a typo in my notes here. Oh no, it's not a typo. This thing is then equal to EI minus EF times F epsilon dot XI. So what we've got then is that this uh, transition rate is 4 pi squared alpha C N sub R over H bar B omega K EF minus EI squared F sub I squared F epsilon dot X. In fact, maybe because we're, we've got it somewhat simplified now. Looks like this. Okay, so that's our expression for the transition rate. And uh, so it's all finished except for computing this matrix element and multiplying by a density of final states and summing over final states. And the, um, the form now of this matrix element tells us that, well, what the, what the, it tells various things. Um, in particular, the there's something called the dipole moment of the atom, and that's Q times F X I. Well, this is the dipole moment of the transition, let's say. All right, now, I'm going to talk now about selection rules for a little while. Um, <coughs> And let me also point out that because of this delta function, this EF minus EI is equal to omega K squared, effectively, because of the delta function. So we can make that replacement if we want. Now let's get back to this um, matrix element. Um, Let's suppose that um, P sub R of K is the Z hat, just as an example. Then, then epsilon sub R of K dot X is equal to uh, Z, simply. And so this structure here will commute, Z commutes with LZ. And that means then that this operator doesn't change the magnetic quantum number of the initial state. So if we have this, the, if we choose the initial state to be an eigenstate of LZ with say eigenvalue um, M initial, so that then uh, M final is equal to M initial. But that's only if epsilon sub r is in the c direction. If, on the other hand, um, and that, by the way, would mean, this doesn't mean that the momentum is in the c direction. It means, in fact, the momentum would have to be in the xy plane. This thing would be actual z. But uh, sometimes the light is coming, uh, is, is arranged such that epsilon sub r of k is, for example, x hat or y hat. In that case, you remember that you can write x and uh, y are, or at least x, x and y are linear combinations of r, y, 1, plus or minus 1. Okay? And that means then that, that in this case, m final then is m initial plus or minus 1 if 
if epsilon sub r is in the x or the y direction. So that's one set of selection rules. Now, another set of selection rules comes from the fact that the hydrogen atom treated non-relativistically is invariant, so each matter is invariant under parity transformations. Parity where you flip space to x to minus x. And so you can choose the eigenstates of n and lm, the eigenstates of parity, and in fact the value of this is minus 1 to the l n and lm. They're automatically eigenstates of parity the way we normally set things up. And so now let's look at this matrix element. This matrix element has an operator here, epsilon dot x, such that if we have p minus 1 p, this is minus epsilon dot x. Okay, because under parity, p minus 1 x p is minus x. So what that means is if the initial state is even under parity, x times the initial state is odd under parity, and then the final state must be odd under parity. So the rule is parity must change. Now this is true in the dipole approximation. If you went beyond the dipole approximation, that selection rule would go away. Because if you kept this term, you'd have two x's, and so you'd have terms in this matrix element that would be quadratic in x, even under parity would allow parity not to change. And so if, okay, so that's, one can also go, one can go a little bit further here. This thing here is an L equals 1 object. If you remember back in the homework problem that was, the homework problem that had 300 parts, I think it was homework 2 or 3, and what you did there was you worked through basically the vector part of the Wigner-Eckhart theorem. And this thing transforms as a vector, it is a vector, and so this is an L equals 1 object. And so we have some L here, L initial, L equals 1. That means that this whole object is L initial or L initial plus or minus 1. And so L final can either be L initial or L final can be L initial plus or minus 1 by angular momentum conservation. On the other hand, L final can't be L initial because of parity. So the selection rule then is, in the dipole approximation, the final L has to differ from the initial L by 1 unit, and that the parity must change, and according to which way the polarization is, either the magnetic quantum number doesn't change or it does change by 1 unit. So those are the selection rules. They're also in the photon dipole approximation. All right, so now we come to, all right, we've got time. Now we come to something that's quite cute, actually. It's called the sum rule. You see, we've got two things that we have to do. We have to somehow compute this thing. And moreover, it's worse than that because we have to sum over final states. Because what we really want to do is compute what the total cross-section is integrated over frequency. And, all right, so let me get a quick bit of tea here. Damn, I've got to pass out the rice crackers. And, of course, I 
I have chocolate, so in my pocket. So anybody wants a question and makes a correction. All right. So now I'm going to start the business of this proof here. Let's consider this matrix element I, epsilon dot X, epsilon dot X, H0 matter, double conjugate I. Well, you might say R has gone blank. You just put it in extra commutator. But in fact, this is actually a useful thing. And notice I've got the initial state on both sides. All right. So what is that? Well, that's going to be I, epsilon dot X, epsilon dot X, H0 minus H0, epsilon dot X, minus epsilon dot X. I've dropped the M from H0. OK, so that's all one line, basically. Now, we've got terms here. This H0 on the outside hits the I state. This H0 hits this I state with two minus signs. And so what you get is 2EI times I, epsilon dot X squared I. And then we have the cross terms, minus 2I, epsilon dot X, H0, epsilon dot X, I. Now we insert a complete set of states to cope with this. And so what we get is sum on N, 2EI, I, epsilon dot X, N, N. And by N, I mean NLM. I'm summing over all the hydrogen atom states. Epsilon dot X, I, minus 2EN. This is for the H0 inside. I, epsilon dot X, N, N, epsilon dot X, I. And so altogether, this thing is twice the sum over all the states. In fact, I might add NLM. EI minus EN times the absolute value squared of I, epsilon dot X, N squared. OK, so you see there's actually some sense to what I'm doing. Because this is a sum over these things. And over here, we also have the sum over these things. And in fact, since omega K is the same thing as EF minus EI, this thing is really, what we can really do here, is cancel omega K and the square there because of this delta function. And so what we've got is a sum of the squares of epsilon dot X, FI instead of NI. And then we have the energy difference. So this thing here is exactly what we need. And we see it's actually this double commutator, which, of course, doesn't look like a great deal of fun. Anyway, so let's imagine, let's now specialize with the case where this is the ground state of hydrogen. All right. So then we want to integrate W, the full rate P omega. And that means we integrate W hat rho of E final, density of final states, over E final. And we're also integrating over frequency. And so that is then integral sum over final states 
4 pi squared alpha h bar c n sub r omega fi. One can write ef minus ei as omega fi also. 1 over v f f1 dot x i squared times delta of ef minus ei minus h bar omega k. And now I'm writing dh bar omega k divided by h bar just to, so we don't have to remember how the uh, delta function, uh, how, how delta function constant times x works. And, excuse me, so this is all together um, a sum over the final states 4 pi squared alpha alpha to C n sub r of k that's the number of photons in this kth model omega fi over v f epsilon dot x i squared so that's where we are. But now, you've got that identity over here, so I'll just point to it rather than use it again. And so what I want to do is compute this. Well, let's remember that epsilon dot x, h0, we've already used that. We know that that well, we haven't used that, but it's almost the same thing as, remember we had, let's see, what did we do over there? Yeah, we did, do, we did do the same thing. So this, in fact, is I h bar over m epsilon dot p. In other words, the coming of x with h0 is effectively p. And so, epsilon dot x commutated, this double commutated, that looks kind of formidable, is in fact just i h bar over m epsilon dot x commutator epsilon dot p. But if there's anything you can compute with quantum mechanics, it's the commutator of x with p. That's just i h bar delta i j. So this gives us i h bar over m sum on i j epsilon i, epsilon j, xi, pj, and so this is minus h bar squared over m sum epsilon i, epsilon j, delta i j, which gives us just minus h bar squared over m since uh, the epsilons are normalized, the normal polarization. Okay, well, that means that this, this thing that we found over here is much more useful than we thought. Namely, it tells us that this sum on a little farther by here. Oh, that's good. That's good, actually. All right, so we've got EI minus EN here. If we change the sign of it, then what we've got is some EF minus EI times F epsilon dot x I absolute value squared is equal to H bar squared over 2M. Wait a minute, I've got them. right, okay. All right, so that's our expression. This thing is called the Thomas Reicher Kuhn sum roll. And it's an example, it's an example of of um oh. Yeah, all right, let me pull you up to class. Okay?
Um, so some rules, this is a sum rule, and some rules are really magical. They take all these things that are extremely complicated to calculate. You can just imagine trying to, you know, if you were some sadistic professor and you had some graduate student who you really wanted to torture, you tell them to compute this thing, the first five terms, the first 50 terms, the first 100 terms. But the thing is identically equal to h bar squared over 2 n. So that's, um, that's one of the, every now and then in physics, um, a sun rule pops up. And when it does, it's always a cause for celebration. And they, they typically come from either unitarity or, or some completeness relation. OK. So that's the Thomas Reichert Kuhn sum rule. So now, this thing that we've got here, uh, we've got this sum, omega fi times this thing. All we do is replace it by h bar squared over 2m. And when we do, then we get the integral of w d omega is equal to 2 pi squared over m alpha h bar c n sub r of k 1 over v. Now we're still not happy because of that 1 over v, but in fact the flux of photons here is n sub r of k c over v. That's the number of photons per second per, per unit area. Uh, coming across. And so the, the integral of the total cross section, total absorption cross section, the omega, is then equal to 2 pi squared over m alpha h bar c n over v divided by the flux, which is n c over v. And when that's done, what happens is the n and the c go away, and you get 2 pi squared alpha h bar over m. OK, so this is the total absorption cross-section. Um, now, the, this is, uh, it's nice, the quantum field theory and atomic physics, quantum electrodynamics and uh, atomic physics allow us to compute this thing. Is it right? Yes, it's the right answer. It's the lowest order. And uh, on the other hand, it's also something that people were able to, they were able to compute this using the atomic physics and a semi-classical treatment of the electromagnetic field. You don't really need, you can sort of wave your arms around and get the same number uh, uh, without quantizing the electromagnetic field. Um, but the calculation we're going to do next, which will be spontaneous emission, will, um, will show us that that's uh, the, that, that's the process that you can't do without uh, quantizing the electromagnetic field. So let's see. Um, we've got a few minutes left. Um, I've got my notes for spontaneous emission, but I haven't translated them into SI units yet. They're still in unrationalized heaviside Lorentz units. Because um, I could for variety. You want to just see that process in the unrationalized units? What do you think? Do you, you want me to stay with SI units throughout the course? Come on, need guidance, guys. I wouldn't mind like seeing it. I'd like to see it in the heavy side, whatever you want to see. You want to see it in the other unit? All right. No fouls. Okay. Um, all right. Well, let's. We're, we're not going to be able to get too far today. We can go the rest of the way uh, on Wednesday. So let's start with 
an atom in the in the n equals two level, and um, we can get, we just know that to first order we're going to have as our potential it's going to be final um, minus q minus q over m a dot p initial. Okay, we know that's going to be the case. And in fact, it's going to be there's going to be a photon here, which um, I might as well just call K, since it's just going to be one of them. Uh, now, what can we tell just from the selection rules? We know this. This is the same matrix element essentially, except that the photons are in different places. So, after the photon goes away, it gets cleared with an annihilation with a creation operator in this case. Um, we're going to be left with an initial and a final and a P matrix element. What does that mean? That means parity must change. So P, so so um, L is well, our parity must change, and we know this is going to be a this is going to turn into an X, and consequently L is going to L final is going to be L initial plus or minus one. Okay. And so that, that's why I chose, since we're, we're thinking of going down to the ground state, the final state is going to be one, zero, zero, and the photon moving away from the atom with momentum K. So I picked the second, for the simplicity, the second excited N equals two, L equals one. This is the simplest possible choice, and then M is is going to be uh, one zero or minus one, depending on the direction of, of the photon and the direction of, the, of its polarization vectors. Okay. So now, in in these other units, and I suppose it's it's reasonable to see this for once in these other units because. Most folks do use the other units. Um, what we're going to have then is F K and I'll just suppress the polarization S of T zero I is going to be then minus I integral zero to T one zero zero momentum k e to the i h zero field plus h zero matter t prime h bar and in these units it's minus e over m c p dot a of x and zero and then times e to the minus i H zero matter plus H zero field T prime over H bar the initial state which is two one M D T prime so that's the that's the equation but sort of a staircase equation um, in these S I unit in these non S I units. UHL units, A of X and zero is the usual <coughs> sum over K and uh, R. It's Planck's constant, not Planck's constants over two pi, not H bar. H C squared over V omega K in one half. And the rest is the same. Well, for some use I use it makes sense using e sub bar k, a sub bar k, e to the i k dot x, plus e sub bar star, a sub bar dagger, e to the minus sign k dot x. So everything's the same, it's just this, the number inside the square root is a little different. And So, um, 
this matrix element FK as I then is putting these things together, we have I E over H bar M C. We have the square root of H C squared over B omega. And T to the 0 T E to the I. And now it is E ground state, E1 plus H bar omega minus E2. Remember these the lowest order in hydrogen, the energies don't depend upon the orbital, on the angular quantum numbers. We have sum of K and R, 1, 0, 0, K. P dot E R star E R dagger of K. E to the minus I K dot X. 2, 1, M. T, T prime. Okay, so that's the thing that we need to compute. And by the way, thanks for raising the boards. Um, so that's the expression and the course. Um, K A sub R I don't know, I wrote this somewhere preciously. Um, say K R A dagger R prime K prime zero photons is square root of zero plus one. It's N plus N plus one delta R R prime delta K. It's a chronic of delta in K because we quantize in a box. And uh, so that's just amounts to a delta function. Delta, chronic of delta. And so then this matrix element F K S I is then E over H bar M C H C squared over V omega to the one half a matrix element 1, 0, 0, P dot E star, P to the minus I, K dot X, 2, 1, M, that's a 1, 2, 1, M, times E to the I, omega 1, 2 plus omega T minus 1 over omega 1, 2 plus omega. So I'm just backing out the H bar. And um, the transition rate then, apart from final states, is something I call W hat. I goes to F is then pi over H bar, E over MC squared, HC squared over omega V, this matrix element, P dot E star, E to the minus I, K dot X. 2, 1, M squared delta of E1 minus E2 plus H omega. So that's basically what we have to compute. Um, now once again, we can make the dipole approximation. Although here, if we're going from 2 to 1, the photon is going to be in the UV um, rather than in uh, the visible. So it's not 1 over 1,000, but um, it's still an excellent approximation. And 
So as before, then, what we're going to say is that 1, 0, 0, um, P times E to the minus I K dot X to 1 M is going to be approximately 1, 0, 0, P to 1 M. And that's going to be M over I H bar. 1, 0, 0, the commutator of x with uh, H0n to 1n. And then, because these are eigenstates, this, these states are eigenstates of H0n, this altogether gives us Im omega 1, 2, which is E1 minus E2 over H prime times 1, 0, 0, x times 2, 1, n. So we reduce this very complicated expression by means of the dipole approximation and then the little trick to just essentially the dipole moment of the atom. And now, now it's a matter of computing that, and we're already over, we're over time, so I don't think we should go any further uh, today. But the next thing is is to figure out how how to compute this realistically. And um, it turns out that you see, I mean, once you've seen this, this grinding is kind of the same thing almost. It's sort of easy once you've seen that. But uh, figuring out which way the photon's going, which way the polarization vectors are, um, that um, requires a little bit of thought. It's not deep, it's not hard, but it's, it's a little bit of new thought, so you might find that interesting.